Welcome everyone and thanks for joining in this tutorial session. My name is Christian Hirsch. I'm assistant professor at the University of Groningen in the Netherlands. And today I will walk you through how to do statistical hypothesis testing through TDA. Now, before we move into the statistics, let's look at some use cases. So first of all, from astronomy, what we see here is a simulation of the universe at the large scale. And this is really not an exaggeration because these little dots that you see here, these are supposed to be galaxies. Now the question is, do these galaxies just scatter randomly at space or do they align along certain structures like fibers or surfaces? And how could we detect it? And how could we develop a statistical test that tells us whether we really see some structure or just noise. Then on a very different application context, we can look at an example from biomedicine. Namely, what we see here is an <clears throat> image of the artery network in a brain. Now, if we have such detailed data, then there's a good chance that this can give us some hints on whether this person might be at risk of developing maybe a stroke, or some neurodegenerative diseases. But then the question is again, how do we extract certain features from this complex topology, from this complex morphology? And how do we build um, statistical tests to really um, check the hypothesis, whether this is uh, um, a sample from a healthy patient? Now, to deal with these questions, a nice tool from TDA is the persistence diagram. So I won't go into the detail how to construct it because there are excellent tutorials on that already available that I can uh, highly recommend. But now if we start from the simplest um, points or data points that we can have, namely point processes, then we already see striking differences on the level of the persistence diagram. For instance, here we have see complete spatial randomness, and on the left and on the right, we have a bit more regular and a bit more structured data. And as I said, if we go on the level of the persistence diagram, we see striking differences. And this can also be extended to network data. Like if we look, think of the um, artery network in the brain, also here we can develop some notion of um, persistence diagram or persistence barcodes. And the question now from a statistical point of view is, um, when we see these differences, do we really need to just say, okay, this looks very different, or do we have a principal statistical method that can uh, help us to develop a test which says on the significance level, this uh, data is uh, significantly different from noise? Well, in order to develop such a test, first of all, there are certain questions and uh, crossroads um, where we arrive and where we have to make a decision. So first of all, how complex is the data topologically that we're dealing with? Maybe the signal that we want to um, detect is already encoded in um, just a deviation of the distances between points when we compare this to um, complete spatial randomness. In that case, we can rely on a very, very well-developed um, statistical um, toolkit developed or um, provided by spatial statistics. So here we can really have very um, refined tools that, such as the K function or the L function that allow us to detect certain patterns of repulsion, certain patterns of attraction over specific distances. But say now we are in a more complex setting where we really are convinced that in order to detect certain shapes, um, these distances will not be enough, but we do need the uh, methodology of TDA. And the um, advantage of this methodology is furthermore that we can also apply it to data, which at least at first looks is not at all embedded in Euclidean space, but might be just given by some, some arbitrary distance matrix. Now, say we are really convinced that we need TDA, then the next question is, what are good test statistics? And again, 
This depends highly on what of kind of structure we want to detect. Maybe there are just a few points that have a vastly different persistence, a vastly different lifetime than a complete spatial randomness. Then we would look at certain characteristics um, that are built from maximal persistence, like maybe the maximal persistence itself, the persistence landscape, or suitably weighted persistence silhouettes. On the other hand, there might also be situations where it's not just a single data point or a few data points that are different from noise, but where just on average, the, the persistence diagram looks very different. In that case, we might go to persistent petty numbers, specific ones, and maybe um, motivated from the application context, Euler characteristic curves, or another um, summary statistic like the accumulated persistence function. So let's say we have our test statistics and how do we compute the p-values? Again, two you know, kinds of choices. First of all, there's bootstrap and replication tests where roughly speaking, what we do is we compute specific p-values by taking a large number of simulations or a large number of bootstrap samples under the null model. And there are different um, approaches so far, but the upshot of all of this is they are very flexible because you can really specify the null model and just take samples or simulate. But if you work on large scales, it can be very expensive. There's some refinement to that where you model exactly the um, persistence diagram and not the data behind that, which is a bit less expensive on the computational side, but you need to invest um, a certain amount of getting um, into the theory. On the other hand, there are large sample estimates of this. So loosely speaking, if we work on large domains, then uh, there's a hope that the test statistics that we are looking at are satisfying uh, or subject to some very general um, limit theorems, namely, for instance, the central limit theorem, Poisson approximation theorem. And these results uh, then give us a universal test statistics maybe Gaussian test statistics were from which we could draw the p-values. Again, uh, <clears throat> the, the advantage is on the one hand that we have um, now a test statistic which is um, decoupled from the sampling window. But um, on the other hand, if we do have finite sampling windows, then um, there might be some finite volume effects such that the p-values get indexed. Finally, to walk you through a specific example, here's an um, example from neuroscience, the mini column hypothesis, where we um, hypothesize that the neurons arrange in certain columns. Now, if we would project these columns into the two dimensional space, we would expect to have certain clusters. The question is do we see certain clusters here, or is it complete spatial randomness? Looking just at the persistence diagrams would not give us such a um, big um, insight, but if we compute certain summary statistics such as um, the accumulated lifetimes or such as the total persistence, then with um, using the asymptotic Gaussianity, um, we can indeed derive a p-value. And in this case, it would say, okay, um, for instance, at the 5% significant level, um, we would say we, we do not have um, complete spatial randomness, but maybe there might be some clustering. All right, so thanks a lot for listening. If you have further questions, then please do feel free to get in touch with me, and I will be very happy to hear about the specific data that you are looking at. Bye.